Welcome everyone to Your Desk University, bringing you live learning with AEC tech experts directly to your desk. My name is Tim and Hazel. I'm a senior technical designer at Walter P. Moore. Tonight, I'll be your host as we continue this great series with another AEC tech expert. Tonight, we'll talk about developing great code libraries. It doesn't matter what language you choose, the tips will be universal. If you're a visual programmer, you will also find tons of tips that can be adopted to your use as well. I'll introduce our speaker in a moment, but first, let's re recap some of our other sessions that we have covered. We've had Dynamo, Why So Serious with John Pearson from Parallax. Thanks, John, for an awesome presentation. We had two great speakers, Olivia Morgan and Model Space, Olivia Morgan from Model Space and Nick Jacobson of Mixed Surgical Technologies. They talked about some of the truths behind 3D face shield making during this current COVID crisis. And our previous session was Repeatable Grasshopper with Kadeem from Walter P. Moore. Also a huge thanks to some of our team. You know me by now. The others at the top here have been a huge part of the launching team. Lebo Lee from AEC Lab. Not only did they just launch their bib consultancy, but he's currently hosting and managing our website in his spare time. Jared Friedman from Walter P. Moore has been helping collect speakers, work on web framework, and you can give him credit for our great graphics. Any of those ones that look a little bit more sketchy, those are probably coming from me. And on your far right, we have John Skippers of Adaptive Studio and co-organizer of Dynamo DC plus Grasshopper and Automation. He really helped Your Desk University get started, supports our live streaming, and co-leads our user group outreach. Thank you to this team. Speaking of our user groups, our goal has always been to support the AEC tech community. User groups are on the front line of doing just that. So we have been partnering with user groups to help bring you quality live streams with quality speakers. If your user group wants to join the initiative, reach out to me on Twitter, LinkedIn, or Slack. We would love to join forces with you. Oh my, did you see who we have in our lineup after tonight? Cesar Escalante, Ryan Cameron, and Aaron White. They are going to be helping us understand in a broader way successes and failures they have had in their companies as, they, as they've helped to lead this digital revolution. Bring your questions as always. We would love the, inter we love the interactive part. You can always comment over in the live chat, or if you're watching this afterwards, post your comments and we'll try to get to them afterwards. And now to our speaker, Peter Michiv from NBBJ. Hi, Peter. Hey guys, thanks for having me. Yeah, thanks so much. Peter, I have to say, this guy, he's elusive. Have you ever seen someone online and hoped to run into them at a conference? Well, I've tried twice. Somehow, we've had tons of conversations online, but missed each other in person. So I'm counting this one as real. I got you this time. Got it. You can find his machine learning and IoT classes recorded online. He works at NBBJ and also and there, and he leads the design computation team but spends most of his time these days designing and building software with a focus on spatial computing and data-driven solutions. Peter, before you get started, can you help um, this community understand you a little bit more um, outside of work? Um, what kind of things do you do when you're not coding at work? Yeah, I mean, there's unfortunately not that much time outside of work, <laughs> but I really do like to spend a, a bunch of time woodworking um, it is a big hobby of mine, photography, even though I'm pretty, pretty bad at it. Um, and then I, of course, I always try to pursue uh, just interesting projects and side, side engagements that kind of push me outside of my comfort zone and uh, lead to some of the things like the IoT workshop. So yeah, interesting stuff. That IoT workshop series was really cool. Um, how many was it? Eight classes? Six classes? It is, yeah. Halfway through, I think it's, I think it's about that many, and then I've, I've got to wrap up the second half, which is, which is long overdue, unfortunately, and oh release that as well. Okay, that's really cool. What do you have for us today? Uh, well, today we're going to be talking about how to build useful uh, code libraries, not just building, but also maintaining them, um, so that you just get as much as possible out of the time that you spent uh, building those up. All right. Thanks so much. Take it away. All right. I will. So let me start uh, presenting here. I'm going to need to share my screen. Oh, there we go. You guys got the screen. Awesome. Uh, I don't know why it's not letting me go full screen. Uh oh, it's getting ahead of me. It's ruining my big reveal. Oh All no. Right. 
so talking about creating and maintaining uh, code libraries. All right, let's get right into it. Um, so I'm going to start with a, just a real quick introduction of who I am so that you guys can kind of decide whether you want to um, listen or, or believe what I'm saying. Um, and then I've kind of structured it around three, three um, pillars, which I think for me are the most important. So legibility, um, reusability, and maintainability. Um, so we're gonna gonna really focus around those topics. A um, little bit about me first. Um, so my name is Peter. I lead the design computation team at NDBJ. Um, those are my contact handles. If you wanna uh, yell at me or about something right after this, totally acceptable. Um, or if you wanna reach out for anything uh, more interesting. Um, and this is kind of my background. So I've I've been a little bit all over the place. Um, desktop. I'm currently mostly focusing on web um, with a kind of a, well, I, I would love to say a front end focus, but it's more of a full stack focus. <laughs> um, so both back end, front end um, and have, uh, yeah, just, just really interacted with a, a bunch of different things over time um, in a lot of different mediums, which is which has actually been quite fun. Um, so I want to start out with uh, this. So I don't know if anybody here watches Silicon Valley, but if you don't, you definitely should. And if you do, you already know where it is. Um, but these are the controlling triangles of success. And those of you that have seen any of my talks anywhere, you absolutely know that I have to uh, get started with a partially uh, bullshit infographic about what we're going to talk about. <laughs> Very loosely structured around the concepts that I previously mentioned. So here's our own version of that. Um, we've got legibility at the bottom, which uh, for me, honestly, though, it, it really is kind of the foundation of everything. Um, and from that, you've got maintainability and reusability, which are uh, supporting any kind of shot that you ever could have of growth or scaling your code um, and really getting as much value out of it as possible. Um, and right in the middle is what I like to call reducing cognitive load, which you could probably rephrase a ton of different ways. But um, I feel like every time I'm, I'm thinking around a, a software architecture or just, just general practice around thinking about code, writing it, um, executing or testing it, I, I find that from a developer's point of view, if you focus on what it is to reduce cognitive load, then you're really focusing on what it is um, to build a useful and highly functional code base. So um, I'll kind of touch on that a little bit as well. All right. So first, we're going to start with legibility. And legibility for me is really um, bridging the gap to understanding. Uh, it, you need to understand the code you're working with in order for it to be useful. And you need to be able to read it before you can understand it. Um, and understanding obviously takes a lot more than reading, but this is the first step. So a first step uh, or practice, I guess, that I, I wanna mention is doc strings. And I guess before I shoot off into any of this, um, I'm kind of assuming that we've got a very broad audience amongst us, beginners, experts, everything in between. So some of these might, uh, be very familiar, or it might be the first time you've encountered them. But um, either way, I, I think it's worth mentioning because even even the people that know about this, I feel like don't don't practice it all the time, and I'm one of those people. Um, all right, There's so best practices, a, a and then of, we don't always follow them, right? Yeah, no, we certainly don't. Even even when it's your own best practices, unfortunately. Um, so we've got a, a snippet of Python code here, and um, we've got a function to find auto convert file size. Awesome. We've got the code here. Um, and then we've got this bit of text here, which may or may not look familiar. And that is what essentially a doc string is. And most every language, at least the ones that I've, I've worked with, and I think are most common in our trade here, um, have this convention. And it's basically a way of documenting what the function does. Um, and also spitting out a little bit of, of information and hints for the person or the program that's going to consume this after you about its actual um, inner working. So in this case, we absolutely need to put in, in order to convert the file size, an array of bytes. So we've got that defined here. Um, we know exactly what it means. We know the type of uh, thing that we have to pass in, and we can expect what the function is going to return. Um, and again, this is a this is a common format amongst um, major major languages. So this is a little snippet of JavaScript right here. Very same thing. Uh, looks a little bit different though. So the doc string is formatted slightly differently. We've got uh, stars as opposed to pound signs. But same thing. We're defining parameters. We're defining types, and we're defining the variables that we have to put in in order to get something useful out of this function as well as uh, providing, of course, some clue as to what this thing even does in the first place. We've got a snippet of C-sharp here as well. 
Um, and again, looks a little bit different. Um, C Sharp uses a uh, XML convention, um, which is just some string formatting. But again, same thing. We're, we're defining mm -hmm. the variables that go into this function and uh, what they mean and the inner workings of the thing and what it's supposed to return. Um, and if you do this, obviously, for somebody looking at this code, it's exceedingly useful, right? I mean, if, if you have to edit any of these functions, you jump right into this with a knowledge of what the person before you did and what you're supposed to replicate, or at least not break if you start touching it. Um, but there are other benefits, I think. So um, there's auto documentation, which we'll look at more in depth a little bit later. And there's syntax and type hinting. Um, and those are two like tangible artifacts that you can get out of practicing this kind of doctrine convention and methodology. Um, in addition to that, of course, you get some abstract benefits like understanding, navigating, and accessibility. So going back to what I was saying about another developer jumping in this code or you jumping into another developer's code, um, it's a lot easier to start manipulating something that you're unfamiliar with if there's kind of a Rosetta Stone in the beginning to help you navigate what's already there. Um, and that's even true for yourself. If, if you write something and then pick it up two months uh, or two years later, you're going to be a, a very grateful to yourself if you've left yourself a little bit of breadcrumbs in order to figure out what you were doing before. Because sometimes, I think we can all relate, when you're in the middle of doing something, um, it's, it's not exactly as straightforward as you might think. And your, your seemingly logical uh, practices might seem quite illogical when you're looking at it outside of a deadline. Um, but going back to those artifacts that I was that I was mentioning, so um, type hinting. If you practice doc strings, uh, most IDEs, which are places where you write code, forget exactly what the acronym stands for, but um, they will give you some kind of hints about the functions that you're using. So at the top, we have a snippet from a, a PyCharm, which is using some Python code. Um, and it's using that auto convert file size function that we looked at before. And as I'm writing this, I'm getting a hint that I'm supposed to input an integer that is the size in bytes in order for this function to do something useful. Um, same thing with the JavaScript snippet. So I'm I'm working on a personal personal project here, and I've created this function called get all. Well, my IDE this time WebStorm um, is doing a similar thing. It's telling me exactly what the function is going to do, and it's telling me the uh, parameters that I need to pass in in order for it to be useful. So um, this is more on the side of something tangible um, because you can see it, you can use it, and I mean, it, it, I've used these IDEs as an example, but this is you know transcends these two examples, and it, it's 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 pretty much everywhere. Um, and in addition to that, the other asset, which is another one of our points, is documentation. So again, this is this is coming directly from those snippets that we looked at before, the same doc strings. But um, if you were to create a code library and uh, populate it with doc strings, this is from Python using the Sphinx library. Uh, this is an output that you can uh, just get from an automated command. Um, we've created all these functions or classes, whatever they might be, and if we've documented them correctly in the right format. Um, we run a command and we just generate this. And every time we change the code base, uh, we just rerun this and we regenerate the documentation. Um, example with JavaScript as well. This time it's from a package that's uh, literally and, and rather plainly just called documentation from NPM, but it's exceedingly useful. Um, again, just coming from the snippets that we saw, same convention, same format. Um, we get this interactive HTML uh, document which can uh, inform other users or again even ourselves for how to use this library that we've created in uh, yeah in the future. And this is just coming directly from those doc strings you generated previously. It's just exactly, generating yeah, that documentation. Else. Yep, that's really yep. nice. It's just the due diligence of putting them in the first place, and then they're just getting spit out. Um, and this is the C sharp example. Um, this is from a, and all of these, by the way, are actually from um, personal projects that I, I create and maintain. So this is this is stuff that I I do and I find useful. Hmm. Um, and yeah, so this is from a helper library that I have for the Revit API. Uh, but the curtain panel class, um, again, I've just been diligent about following the doc strict convention um, throughout my class, my functions. And this is an auto-generated HTML, which I can deploy 
um, well, anywhere really that that, that can serve a, a static web page, mm. and then I can browse this, click on things, and um, explore my uh, my uh, code library in a little bit more detail as I'm trying to use it somewhere else. Or again, um, in, in my situation, if I'm sharing it with another developer, mm. if it's an open source project and you're expecting users to use it, this is this makes it a lot easier for them to um, engage with. And the best projects have this, and I'm sure that you guys can. Um, think of some. Um, uh, what's a what's a what's a good one? PyRevit is is a great open source mm -hmm. project with brilliant documentation. Um, Guy Guy Tellerico also had the um, Revit Python wrapper before that, um, and it was useful. But also, it was useful because there was a great roadmap for using it. The documentation. Um, nice. All right. Thanks. So another, by the way, you've got piece. 39 people watching you live right now um, and growing. All right. So, that's, oh man, that's awesome. And uh, we hope lost your video. I don't know if we can get it back or not. Um, oh no, it's not a big deal. Was it's it, not um, the end of the world. When you started sharing, we lost it. Um, like I said, oh, gotcha. I don't, we don't need to spend a lot of time on that, but, uh, let me click the button and see if it's working. Oh, there we go. Yeah. All right. Our that, the big good. reveal, right? The beardless the reveal, face. Man. The big reveal. Oh man, yeah. Let's see if, if any of my colleagues are seeing this. Maybe they'll. Well, uh, Kyle yeah, Martin already commented on it and said he didn't know there was a <laughs> face under that beard. No, no, I didn't know. I was curious about like what this looks like too. Um, it's my uh, it's my apocalypse look. All right. <laughs> All right. Um, Thanks. Let's go back. So uh, another piece um, that I think really helps legibility is code comments. So. Um, this one is is maybe the le the least sexy because it doesn't give you any <laughs> tangible artifacts like the um, hinting or the documentation, um, but it's it's crucial for other developers using this. So we've got the same function here, left and right, and um, you don't need to know JavaScript to to I think relate to the slide. But let's say you were a developer and picking this up, I mean, which one would you honestly rather have to deal with? Um, I, I think I think the answer is the one on the right um, mm -hmm. because there's a lot of description as to what's going on on every line. And even if you do know JavaScript, I might add that this is kind of funky. And I purposely <laughs> chose a really funky function um, that I created because it's it's optimized for performance. That's beside the fact. But um, this is kind of hard to read. Even if you know JavaScript, you're like, wait, what? what why is we're, why are we looping over an increasing or decreasing infinity? Like, what is going on here? This is weird syntax. Mm. Um, if I put in these comments, though, uh, you start to get a lot clearer understanding of what I was trying to do and maybe why I was doing it the way that I was trying to do it. So again, this is the syntax for JavaScript, um, but we got this. Oh, this is the same one. Um, we've got the same um, kind of format for, in in this case, C sharp. Um, actually, it looks very similar to JavaScript with just the two uh, forward slashes. Um, but the idea is to input this. Uh, I mean, I've kind of gone overboard with this just for the example, but input this as, as often as you need to in order to explain what's going on. It doesn't need to be every line, obviously, um, but just enough for, for you to um, explain what's going on, either to yourself or to somebody else. Um, this is the Python example. and. Again, this is probably the one that we've we've all um, uh, at least encountered. Probably, I don't know, um, Rhino Dynamo. Um, I know in, in their examples, they probably got a, a little bit of, of commenting in there. Um, it's just the, the hashtag uh, syntax and same thing, but you explain what you're doing and whether it's yourself or somebody else reading this later on has a much clearer understanding of um, what's going on. And again, this is from a personal project. So I, I felt the need to add in these breadcrumbs because um, without these, it, it's maybe not as straightforward. Um, and I should have maybe done all these side by side to have the comparison, but uh, I think you can imagine. Mm -hmm. uh, all right. So why? Again, understanding, navigating, and accessibility. If you have to, if something breaks, if a new version of Revit comes out or uh, Rhino or something else changes, um, or you update a library which doesn't make sense, you're going to want to know where to go back and how to trace the source of it. Um, and if you leave those breadcrumbs for yourself, it's going to be even easier. And the doc strings are great on a chunk by chunk basis, but doc strings really, the lowest level that the doc strings hit are the function level. Um, in order to go line by line, especially for like a bigger method or, or some kind of more complicated piece of functionality, it's worth, I think, going line by line. Um, especially if you're one of those people that like to kind of bundle everything in one script or if it's just kind of a, a very big and bespoke piece of logic, which 
I mean, yeah. they exist. So you're saying doc um, strings for the functions geometry. and comments as you're going. Those are our first two tips. That's exactly that's exactly what I'm saying. We're yep. about ten minutes in, just for a time check. All right, awesome. Um, are you going to cut me off at uh, twenty? Something like that. We'll see what kind of that's questions fair. we get. <laughs> that's fair. Um, all right, you, reusability is the next one. So architecture is a big one. All right, so a lot of what I see happening is that there's this kind of monolithic practice, which um, everybody asks the question, and then they create one thing, and that one thing houses everything. That's just that's it. You've you've solved the problem, and you've created one thing to solve the problem. Um, and every time another question comes up, you you kind of do the same thing. You create another thing, and it's not that you're not solving the problem. You definitely are, but it's kind of living in that one specific thing, and and you're not really getting the most value out of these um, different things that you're creating. You're not creating a life cycle for them. You're creating a fixed start and an end point. So um, I like to think about a, a different kind of architecture, which um, is is modular. So when you start with the same questions, um, you try to break them down into smaller bits and pieces. So um, if you start with something like energy modeling, you know what is a smaller piece? One piece might be solar, one piece might be electric, one piece might be wind, I don't know. Um, but you start breaking down those big monolithic questions in the small modules which have use all over the place. And the good thing about that is, is I mean, at the start, it's not going to seem like much of a difference. You're still going to be doing the same amount of work. But as you go, um, you have the option of using these same things in different pieces um, that you're building in different applications or in different scripts or in different use cases, you can answer more questions and you can leverage other pieces that you've built up. Um, again, if you've broken them out um, in, in a way that's fairly modular and, and that makes sense that they're not really siloed into, into one piece of functionality. So why would you do this? Um, like I said, extra value, you're, you're kind of getting getting extra mileage out of your code because you're not just using it for one app or one script or one one automation. Um, you're using it for for more. And there's one point of truth. When something breaks, you know where to find it. When you want to change something, there's one point, there's one place to change it. There's not 20 or, or 10. Um, and it's much easier to grow that way because after time, you're going to build momentum. You're going to have a lot of modules. You're going to be able to reuse them here and there. And when somebody asks for something complicated, you're going to be able to get to it a lot quicker than um, you were before because everything was really contained. And now you can pull a piece from here, from here, and and you've got a you've got a thing. All right, so um, going along with the reusability bit, um, what does modularity mean? So um, there's a pattern of scripts which I think a lot of us are familiar with. And when one script is created, more scripts are created. And on one hand, there's nothing wrong with this because I mean, again, you're solving problems and things are being iterated and things are being done. Uh, but the lack of organization and relationship between them really um, prevent them from growing past just a sum of the collective pieces. Um, and that's a funky animation. Cool. Um, so instead, I like to think of things in, in modules, going back to the, the previous um, architecture bit. So whether you call it a module or a package, doesn't matter. But um, I'm using the energy example again. So you want to take a, a, a chunk of information or a chunk of intelligence like energy. Again, start breaking it up into different pieces and start breaking those pieces into pieces. So um, now how you cut the question of where to draw the line, where to break up the pieces, I think that kind of comes with time and experience. And it's a, it's a lot of back and forth. I mean, I, I change things um, architecturally on our software always. It's impossible to uh, think that you're going to create the perfect pattern, which is this great diagram, and it's always going to be true. Um, but the point is just try to break it down and have a relationship between these things so that they are um, uh, targeting the same kind of question. They're the same line of inquiry, but they're functioning together as a unit rather than these individual pieces here and there, which solve individual questions. Um, so how does this work technically? So in C Sharp, we've got class libraries. In Python, we have packages. And in JavaScript, we have packages. So packages are, are used pretty inner, inner, um, uh, inner, uh, what's the word, interfrequently? I don't know, inter, not interoperably, but they're interchangeably um, with the word module. Um, uh, hopefully, you guys know that English isn't my first language. Um, but Anyway, the, the point is the same. They they package bits of code and logic into individual pieces that you can consume. And in Python, we can install those with pip install, JavaScript, npm install, C sharp is, I think, NuGet, um, 
And for those of you that have written code, you know exactly what I'm talking about. There's um, a ton of useful libraries out there that we use to do things because there's no sense in reinventing the wheel. Um, all right, reusability. Now going, this is a big one. So environment, the, the where of, of, of what you're doing. So a lot of us do this, which is great, again, because you're solving problems and, and you're iterating that intelligence in something that's, that's functional and replicable. Um, but the problem with this is that it lives and dies in this in this little node. Um, so you could have the the protein folding simulation in there that solves cancer and cures COVID nineteen in twenty four hours. But if it lives and dies in there, we we nobody can. Well, can hopefully you're not that. just so, leaving it in there, right? It, the no, news needs to get not. out. I, hopefully you're not. <laughs> if you've got, got something out. that good. If you got something that good. Which, yeah, if you do, then you go one step up. So this is one step up, slightly less siloed. Um, you could write the thing in a file and consume it in that node. It's still going to do the same thing. Um, but again, going back to our previous architecture and modules talk, um, if you've got a chain of these things, you can pull any one of them in here at any time, and it should be fine. And you can do that inside of Dynamo or Python. You can just read the, the string sure. and then run it as a Python. You certainly can. Um, and one step up from that would be, like I said, having a collection of these things. And again, maybe they live on your computer, uh, you know, hopefully more organized than, than the little jumbled animation that we saw before. But again, um, you can pull any one of these things at any time, whether it's Grasshopper or Dynamo or something else. So what's the next step up from that? The next step up would be to ideally store them in some kind of cloud environment, which can then enable you to deploy these things on different environments. So whether it's visual programming, um, whether it's a desktop, whether it's a laptop, maybe you've got a uh, IT render farm or server farm somewhere where you can run uh, virtual compute, um, or maybe it's a mobile device, or maybe you're just kind of tinkering as I am right now with um, Raspberry Pis and, and Arduino boards and like low-level circuitry, but you can still consume that same logic that you wrote there if you've, if you've um, structured it in a way that's modular enough. Um, so why? You, you've got a, a great record of history, and history is critical for when you're trying to um, um, build something up and understand where you've been and where you're trying to go. Version control is another one. Um, you're going to fix problems as you go along, and you want to be very careful in how you iterate through that, and especially if you've got a user base. Um, heck, even if it's just you, you still want to be careful about not using um, last week's or last month's version, which I, I've done as well. I mean, these are problems that I've encountered. Um, accessibility. So when everything is up on the cloud, like I said, you can pull it anywhere. You can pull it on the Raspberry Pi. On, you can use it on, on your uh, virtual machine. You can use it on your desktop. doesn't matter. Um, QA, QC. Um, testing. Testing can be done in the cloud, which we're going to talk about in a second, and automation. Um, again, if you've got multiple devices which are depending on this code, uh, which you very well might if you've structured it the right way. Um, you want that to happen in real time, and you want the updates to be um, more or less instantaneous. All right, so on the last point here of maintainability. So this is really what allows you to get the most value out of your work, because um, I've seen a lot of, of, of code and code projects that um, stop at a dead end when one person leaves or the team mm -hmm. loses steam or something like that happens. But that's that's not great, because... Um, you want to be building things up with time. You don't want to just leave them and then start from scratch. That's a, there's a lot of upfront cost in that. Um, so going back to our environment, um, one thing that we talked about is history. So this is why history is really, really great. And those of you that have um, worked a bit more with code know where I'm going to go with this slide. But history is great because as you're making changes, whether they're little or big, um, you sometimes want to be able to either go back in time, add new things, or kind of do a mix and match of an a la carte type of dealio where you bring in some of the best parts of the old and best parts of the new, whatever. Um, having a record of that is critical in order for that to work. If mm -hmm. you're always uh, relying on control Z, <laughs> uh, which works in the short term, but not really so much in the long term, uh, it's a problem. And sometimes it's, it's useful. I know I keep saying this, but for when something breaks, if you release a big feature um, and sooner or later, maybe it's six months down the line, but you realize that this one, uh, you know, curtain wall script that you had in Grasshopper and Dynamo suddenly stopped working, um, you're going to want to have an idea of how to trace it back and, and to where it went wrong. So having this kind of history is, is critical. So you're saying um, when you're making like a really big change, you can go back and like find maybe a small piece of the really big change that broke your code 
that you can go back and like solve that because you have so much history. Exactly. Yeah. Or at least have a hint as to where you should mm-hmm. start looking. You know, if, if at one point you, you updated, um, you know, the Rhino framework or the Dynamo framework, mm. um, maybe they changed something in their API. But again, if you have that in your history, that might be a good, good first step for you to take a look at. I mean, it, it won't solve all your problems, but it will reduce the time you spend in, in solving them. Mm-hmm. Um, and with code, really, the, the framework that we have for that is Git which is intimidating to a lot of non-developers, but you really shouldn't be intimidated because all it is is Dropbox. And instead of it auto-saving, instead of hitting the save button, you have to do a command that's called git commit and git push. And there's visual tools for doing that as well. So heck, you don't even need to um, do a command. Yeah, we don't have time to go through like the whole GitHub today, but one of the comments we just got is that a session for Git would be really nice. And uh, that actually feeds into another presentation we'll have where uh, AECOM is going to talk a little bit about how they use Git. Again, it's not going to be like an intro to Git, um, but it might be helpful for those listening. Thanks. It is. Uh, yeah, no, anything would be helpful. Um, if, if you're not using this, but you are writing some kind of code, I, I suggest that you do. Uh, and for me, the, the the leaders in this space are GitHub and GitLab. And actually, GitHub had a huge announcement today. So um, you can't beat that. GitHub is, is essentially all of their features are now free for everyone. Um, as far as I understand, and that's that's really great because um, you don't have to pay anything, and you get a lot of really cool stuff like version control, history, all that stuff we talked about, automated testing, um, all there, and you don't have to do anything besides learn how to use it. You said that was um, GitHub so or another, GitLab that was all free. GitHub, 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 yeah. Even for private repositories. Yeah, yeah, unlimited private repositories, unlimited collaborators, everything is it's the wild west now. Wow, nice. It's all open. Yeah. Um, to be fair, they kind of had to compete with GitLab <laughs> there because GitLab has had that for, for several years. But yeah. hey, you didn't hear that from me. It, it's the war of Microsoft. Actually, it is. Microsoft it's recorded on YouTube open. forever now. So. Yeah. <laughs> oh, no. Oh, man, I forgot. Oh, man, I hope I don't lose my endorsement dollars. I don't have endorsement. <laughs> um, all right. So documentation is another big one for uh, maintainability. If you're keeping up with your doc strings and everything else, um, documentation is going to be generated for you and it's going to be critical for you in terms of growing your code base and making big changes. Um, so the other part we briefly talked about was QA, QC, and I touched on it when I said GitHub and GitLab. Um, but the great thing about writing code, which is modular um, and also hosted in these cloud environments, is that you can um, test and deploy iteratively. So this is a diagram of what's known as CI slash CD in in the development world that stands for continuous integration and continuous deployment. Um, It's it's a fancy term. All it means is that whenever you uh, make a change to your code, you test it. If it works great, um, you release it as a new version or you deploy it somewhere, whatever. Um, And I know a lot of us aren't shipping enterprise grade applications, but it it doesn't matter. Again, if you write a simple function like convert file size, uh, you can test that function. If you write a function like, uh, I don't know, normalize coordinates or normalize a data set, you can test that function. And that's a function that'll serve you well in Rhino, Grasshopper, or the web, doesn't matter. Um, So this is something that you can still take advantage of. Um, Yes, it does get a little bit harder when you're writing something specific to Revit, Rhino, or another tool. you know, it, it might be that you can't test it without those tools, but there's still things you could you could um, you can do, and maybe you have to do them locally, not on the cloud. Um, still, testing is a really, really, really great benefit of of writing a code library mm-hmm. um, the correct way. So, uh, really popular tools: Azure Pipelines. Uh, again, if you sign up for GitHub, would, would now that everything's free, I think they give you like uh, what it's like two thousand free pipeline hours on Azure Pipelines, and all that means is 2,000 free hours of you running tests. Um, believe me when I say that you don't have a code base that's going to take 2,000 <laughs> hours in a month. It's, it's going to be But fine. I have four you, really have have good Dynamo it. nodes with Python inside of them. Oh, I'm testing them all the time. Dynamo nodes? <laughs> that might take four milliseconds, yeah. Um, so you're telling me that these so pipelines, it, if I put them on GitHub, can test, can test about anything? About anything. I mean, if it's dependent on a piece of software like Revit, probably no. Um, but if it's agnostic of, of that and if it's, um, yeah, if it doesn't need an external dependency to, well, dependency is kind of a too big of a blanket, blanket term. If it doesn't need an extra piece of software and license, it more or less 
um, can automate the testing. Yeah. Nice. Um, and we've got another uh, honorable mentions here, Travis CI and Jenkins. So those are mostly used by the web crowd. Um, those are open source frameworks for doing the same thing. Um, just, just worth knowing. I know people work in very different mediums and I don't know um, who all is from what background. So, all right, that is kind of it in short. We're going to end. That's with awesome. We've got some good slide. questions coming your way. So I've got some questions do, coming all back. Right. Yes. Um, all right. Well, in short, that's kind of it. Um, for me, really, those are the big topics um, in terms of creating a useful code library. Um, I don't think that if you're in visual programming land that this is totally, you know, irrelevant to you um, because I know there's a lot of stuff that you can leverage as part of this. So, um, yeah, I'm excited to hear some questions. Yeah, that's really great. Okay, so one question that came in um, was about errors. How do you check raise errors um, when you're working? That's a good point. Um, yeah, so if you're... Uh, I mean, it, it does depend a little bit on the language and the environment that you're working in. Um, there's probably not a not more specificity on that question, but can so we start with maybe Python, just because I yeah, think there'll be that'll be a that. pretty universal language. Here. Um, I know if, there'll if be C sharp Python, and everybody else listening in, but yeah, we'll start if there. <laughs> if you're doing Python, I'm, I'm going to assume that you're maybe operating in a in either a data science context or like a script, like a Node type of um, instance. I so if you're fair. operating in Visual Pro. I think if you're operating in visual programming, the node will yell at you and scream red um, <laughs> because it's not going to, um, you know, it's going to trigger an error. Now, if you're creating um, a code library, though, um, and you want to report that to the user, um, then I think as with any language, you want to leverage the, uh, the natural API that that language has for throwing errors. So um, Python, I, I haven't had to do that in quite a long time. Um, I know that wrapping things in a try catch is like a really stupid way of doing it, but if you wrap it in a try, try, try catch, um, if the statement in the try part fails, basically the catch will execute. Um, so what that typically means is you've got an error. Now, most languages um, at that point will give you an error object to work with. Um, I know JS and NC Sharp do. So that error object typically has a series of properties that you can access. Now, I'm going to flip flop here between languages, but it's kind of the same paradigm. In C sharp, for example, you can get the message of the error. Mm -hmm. um, you can get the stack trace um, and you can get a number of other things, but those are essentially the bits of the pieces that you would get displayed to you in your um, terminal when you flag the error. It's the same thing, mm -hmm. uh, but it's, it's useful pieces if you're trying to log the error or if uh, I guess your environment doesn't give it to you naturally. So, uh, yeah, I'd say look for your language's way of, of specifically throwing up that error. And, and if it's an issue of logging, then write it to a text file or a database. But again, look for that error object mm. and, and go, go see what its properties have to give you. Yeah. So I'm going to get to another question here. Um, so you obviously um, have showed some things that can work in a good team development or team, like where multiple people are working on maybe the same code base at the same time. Um, do you have any tips on working with two people, three people, eight people, I don't know how many, um, and and um, and not like stepping on each other's toes. Obviously Git is a really big um, must have, um, but any other tips yeah. or specifically on, on using that in a team environment? Yeah, um, I'd say Git is your best friend in that sense. Um, but it's, so a lot of people that use Git really um, only kind of use it as a Dropbox. And, and I do that all the time too. There's nothing wrong with that. I'm not, you know, um, but that only works great when it's just you. When you're increasing the number of people, you need to have a workflow for um, how you use Git. And there's a lot of functionality um, in those platforms like GitHub and GitLab that I think are worth leveraging for you. So um, the first thing, first and foremost is branching. All right. So if, if you don't, if you don't have a great understanding of what branching is, I'd say um, Atlassian actually has a phenomenal um, branching tutorial. Um, check that out. But essentially, everybody should be working in their own branch. And at some point in time, they should be merging um, either into each other's branches or into that master branch, which is kind of like the point of truth in your application. Um, and that needs to be happening iteratively, often, often, often. Like it's, It shouldn't be a thing where after one month, some guy is working on feature X and some guy's working on feature Y, and we just like, oh, shit, now we've got like a million merge conflicts. <laughs> You've got to be doing it as often as possible. Um, and I, I really mean that. There's a lot of studies um, from, from huge tech firms that, that basically confirm the same thing. You need to be deploying and merging 
as much as possible, as often as possible when you're working in a um, highly collaborative environment. Um, so that's one. And then the other one is, um, like I said, those features of GitHub, GitLab, so issues, if you don't know what those are, um, take a gander at what they are. Issues and projects, they're basically like um, tasks and a Kanban-esque board of organizing mm -hmm. the tasks and assigning them to people. So, um, I mean, this is, I would say it's even, it's, it's even useful for when you've got a team of two or three people. Yeah. Um, and, and I know that it is because that's, that's how I've, I've managed a lot of products with a lot of success. But especially if you're bigger than that, you've got to take advantage of that. You need, because the best part is it's integrated with um, the commits that you're doing. It's integrated with the code. So it's very easy to assign tasks to people. And then when people make changes, uh, they can even link the changes that they're making. Uh, like if I go back to my, to my little tree, um, um, well, it's kind of hard to do it. But if I go back to my tree, um, it, you can link every one of those uh, nodes and changes back to a certain person, mm -hmm. a certain task. Um, so yeah, um, basically uh, a short, a long way of saying is is um, take take some practices from product development workflows um, and try to apply them to a small team environment. You don't need a scrum master or a dedicated person, but just if everybody takes on five to ten to you know whatever percent of that responsibility and just manages that, I think I think you're in good shape. So your tip there is to everyone work in their own branch. If you have more than one person working, even if you had like two or three people working on a really small project. Oh yeah, absolutely. Even if you're two or three people, work work in individual branches, and then make sure you're merging um, into, into this each master guy or the master branch regularly. Very cool. Thanks. Yeah. Um, yeah. So uh, a question here just came in, kind of related to that. So I'm going to skip some of the other ones to stick with this topic. Um, so working in with code, you know, feels like you know sketching or like a mess kind of can can get created as you're like processing all of this. Um, is that do you feel like it just yeah. gets hindered every time you're having to push to some some cloud? Um, I mean, I think based on what you said earlier, you're you're saying or pulling or pushing. Um, I guess pushing. Yeah, it's kind of more like instead of saving your Word document, you're pushing your changes to the Git environment. Is that kind of what I heard you say earlier? It, it is. Yeah, I would I would um, I would say it's very very similar. Um, and so I mean, for me, that that structure is actually exceedingly useful. Um, I was actually trying to show a, um, a quick example as I'm as talking here, but um, the the pushing to the cloud shouldn't be something that um, that um, um, slows you down or that is a hindrance because if it does, then it's honestly not um, fulfilling its purpose. Honestly, mm -hmm. um, so this is I'm going to show a quick snippet of a, a personal project here that I'm working on, um, and you can see that I, I do this quite frequently. I mean, uh, probably more frequently than most people, but I'm I'm pushing changes often. I'm saying what I'm doing and I'm versioning. Mm -hmm. Um, and this is useful. I mean, it, it, it doesn't take more of my time than just the, as I'm working, like imagine I'm off screen typing, I make a change. All I have to do here is then just click a, a push and okay, there's another button that's commit and then I push and it's up there yeah. and it's a small chore, but then you have this full history, um, where I can basically go back in time and, um, see what I've changed in the code and just understand uh again if something's breaking or if, or if something new is happening yeah that's great um so talking about repeatability we're talking about these libraries um a lot of our viewers and are working mostly with geometry um and the question came in or at least especially this person um i guess you ideally you use code for repetitive tasks what about geometry and modeling in your experience yeah. like how repetitive is that um and I, I'm going to kind of elaborate on this, but isn't every building unique and different? Um, do we really have things that can be repeated between them? Uh, well, I think it depends on the scale of, of how you cut that question. So, I mean, if... I'm blowing it up a little bit if, to give you some room to, to, to yeah, answer yeah, yeah. inside of there. So what I, what I guess is, yeah, so if you're thinking at the scale of a, of a building, um, at the asset of that scale, then I would say... I would say you're maybe thinking more, um, we're gonna get abstract here for a second, but if you're thinking at that scale, I think you're more in the realm of like what, what Hypar is doing um, with their generative design for building elements, um, which is totally cool and interesting. Um, but I think there's also like another scale, or at least the one that I think of it is, which is a much lower level scale, which is like um, thinking of a box in Rhino or a box in Revit. So there's not really a box in Revit, but like, a core piece of geometry. So like what constitutes volume, what constitutes geometry in, in those programs that we work with? Um, 
So if you're thinking of the of what I said first uh, in in the big scale, then I think you're you're um, a little bit starved for a proper type of framework to interact and work with. And I, I mentioned Hypar because they're like the only one I can think of um, to to computationally leverage um, um, geometric intelligence at that scale. Let's let's say for lack of a better way of putting it, it's 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 it's, it's tough to to quite grapple exactly how that wants to be articulated, but um, if you're more on the, I'd say, day-to-day -day side, like for for example, for myself, the side that I interact more with would be for like a simple use case, like creating a curtain wall pattern for somebody in Rhino or Revit or creating like a very specific uh, piece of geometry. Um, and I think at that level, you really have to um, either explicitly speak the language of, of the domain that you're working in. So either Revit speak or Rhino speak um, or decide to really go big and bold and abstract and and start speaking Euclidean geometry, which you then translate to Rhino and Revit speak. Um, but that's a really, really, really big task to bite off. Mm -hmm. um, and there's only one organization that I know that's done that, and they're they're um, they're they're quite big. And I, I wouldn't recommend that for anybody. For other people, uh, for normal for normal people with normal teams, what I would recommend is is maybe um, again curating the chunks at which you work. So maybe you create a library that you use and reuse for Revit. Maybe you create a library that you use and reuse for Rhino. You, just your core tools. It doesn't have to be those two, but your and core maybe tools, even like smaller tools have to be within one. that, not the whole building in one. Exactly. Shot. I mean, it could be right. Um, I mean, look. Let's put it this way: if even if you're like if you create a code library and you use it on only one other project, you've doubled your value because before <laughs> you were creating an app for this, an app for that, an app for this. So even if you create one piece and use it one other place, mm. you've already done double the work. Yeah. Definitely. Um, well, we're getting close to our time here. Uh, we did get one question to kind of come back um, in. I know in Dynamo, there's a way to like import a file and feed it into a node. You mentioned about being able to do that also in Grasshopper. Um, I guess I'm yeah. going to feed two questions out of this. One, is there a way you can do that inside the node so that it imports it? And then the second is outside of the node, is there a way of feeding like a file that it can then process? Uh, and this is in the Grasshopper environment. Yeah, specifically. Uh, yeah. So if you if you throw down a Python node on the Grasshopper canvas, I believe that you're able to right click the node or double click it or something like that. And then there's a little box that you have to click that says Show File Input. Mm. And it, um, if you click that, there's basically like another input nub that pops up um, where you have to put in a file. And I believe then all you have to do is just put in like a file path component in Grasshopper, point it to that py file, and then just feed that into the Python node. Um, That's really cool. I didn't even know that. Um, I knew I know yeah, you can do it yeah, inside of the trip. node because inside the node you can obviously import anything. Um, but that's kind of a really neat trick that um, apparently some of our viewers and myself are learning now. So thanks for your help. Um, oh any yeah, no, it's a it's a cool one. Yeah. Yeah, any other final closing thoughts before we go? Uh, no, I'd say if, if your question didn't get covered or if you just have any other questions, uh, feel free to reach out on any of those channels that I, I mentioned earlier. Um, I know that there's a lot of different skill levels and a lot of different mediums that we work in, so um, don't feel like your your question is, is um, too, too not complex or something like that. I, I, it's completely fine. Um, I, I went through this and learned that at one point too, so. Yeah. Um, yeah, holler if you got a question. Peter, thank you so much for your time. Um, we really appreciate you joining us today. Thank Bye. you very much.